Good morning, Las Vegas. Uh, it's not really morning, but I always wanted to say this. My name is Gil Cohen, I'm, and I will be your host at uh, this almost last lecture. I want to thank you all for attending this lecture. It's not trivial that uh, all of you stayed. I know that uh, many went home or just uh, staying out of the pool. So a, a big shout out to you for uh, uh, coming. And today I'm going to talk about uh, um, uh, remote vulnerabilities in named pipes. So let's begin. Uh, first I'll start off with some uh, uh, introduction of myself. I'm going to tell you about my past or the thing that I can tell you at least. Uh, then we're going to talk about some key terms of uh, uh, Windows named pipes in general in interest process communication. Uh, then I'm going to show you how to connect to named pipes, uh, named pipes access control list, and uh, in the wild, enumerating and sniffing named pipes, fuzzy named pipes, exploitation. Then we'll uh, get uh, we will move on to the f audience favorite part, which is live demos, and then I'll show you some mitigations and the conclusion of my talk. So let's start. My name is Gil, I'm 34 years old and I'm a CEO of Comsec Global. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my company at the end of this lecture. Uh, this is the biggest company in Israel and the most veteran one, 13, uh, 30 years, 150 consultants. And I've been a hacker for about 13 years now. I started in the Israeli military. Uh, I was a penetration tester of all kind, application and infrastructure, uh, and I even worked with uh, some Israeli security agencies. I cannot tell you which because then I have to kill you, and I don't want to kill you at the beginning of my presentation, and you are more than I. So uh, I'll just spare the details. Uh, so I've been uh, hacking to a lot of stuff, including Windows application, and during one of my uh, penetration tests and my hacks, I came across this uh, vulnerability technique that I'm going to show you that was uh, completely unknown or forgotten by penetration testers and this was the motivation for my talk. But before uh, talking about the vulnerability itself, let's start with some key terms just in case you are not familiar with it. So, inter-process communication uh, this is an operating system mechanism that allows processes and applications to manage shared data. You can either use, uh, for example, internal sockets, which uh, probably most of you know, uh, and you have different kinds of uh, inter-process communication as well. Uh, each and every participant in this communication is considered either a client or a server, and it can be both, and you can have multiple clients and multiple servers, end-to-end communication. Uh, and of course, both clients and servers can be uh, defined together. So, uh, Windows named pipes is one of the methods to perform inter-process communication in Windows. It can either be half a uh, one-way or a uh, two-way, uh, or du uh, full duplex, uh, and it utilizes a unique file system that is called NPFS, named pipe file system. It can be accessed by any process in your uh, local operating system, uh, subject to security checks, which is obviously ACLs. So all instances of the same named pipe, a connection to a named pipe is called an instance, uh, have the same name. If you have a uh, named pipe called Gil, then everyone who uh, talks to this named pipe uh, will create an in instance with the same name. So there are many, many configurations and variants of named pipes, half the half duplex or full duplex, byte oriented or packet oriented, local or network. And this is what people miss. So inter-process communication, uh, uh, unlike, uh, unlike its name, is not only internal. It's not only an internal uh, interface uh, in your operating system, it can be um, um, it can be used remotely. A named pipe communication is not encrypted. So if you have any named pipe that is connected remotely, uh, it would uh, use either SMB, port 445, or RPC, uh, which is port 135, and it is totally unencrypted. So you can obviously just sniff it and replay it, and in some cases even perform a man in the middle attack. RPC 
some of you, uh, most of you must uh, probably know it, but I'm going to tell it anyway. This is a protocol that allows one program to invoke services from a program located in another computer. You just call uh, or another service, another process. You just call it um, uh, from one computer to the other. Uh, it uses port 135 and DC RPC is just a variant or a subtype uh, of RPC which allows the programmer to think that uh, the, uh, the processor that he's calling is actually local when in fact it is a remote one. So it just makes the uh, programmer's life a little bit more convenient. SMB uh, or server message block. This is a famous protocol. Uh, it can be used for uh, file sharing um, and printers, serial ports, etc. It's mostly used for file sharing, and probably most of you know it through uh, links like this, URLs that looks like this. You can see uh, 192.168.11 slash c dollar. This is an SMB connection or slash slash file server. This is uh, the famous SMB protocol. It uses port number 445, so if you have any of these ports open, you can connect to named pipes as well. But there are actually two kinds of named pipes, not only the regular named pipes. You also have unnamed pipes or anonymous pipes, not the famous anonymous that you see on the right, but a, a named pipe with a random name. This named pipe is used only between a parent process and each child process. Uh, and it cannot uh, uh, be used for communication over the network and this is why I haven't focused it during my research because I wanted to show to, uh, to see which name pipes can be con connected remotely. So how can you connect to a named pipe? All pipes are placed in a root directory of NPFS which is slash slash uh, the IP address of the computer can be dot, for example, if it's the local computer, slash pipe, slash pipe name. This is how you connect to a pipe, but you cannot just open your Windows run command and just connect to it. Uh, you need a special connection. You, can, you either need to do it using programmer's code or using co dedicated tool that I'm going to show you uh, in the next slides. So here is a, a, a URL, for example, for uh, con connecting to an end pipe. You can see slash slash dot slash slash pipe slash foo. This is a connection to a local pipe. And if you want to uh, connect to the same pipe remotely and the ACL allows it, you just add the IP address instead of the dot character. So uh, the best tool in order to connect to name pipes is IO Ninja. This is a, a commercial tool. It used to be free for a non-commercial usage, but they, they just changed uh, their uh, uh, license agreement. Uh, so now it is paid only, and you can uh, have a non-registered um, copy of it. Uh, and this is like the Swiss army knife of communication in general and named pipes specifically. Uh, you don't necessarily need to use it for regular TCP IP communication because you have Netcat and Nmap and many other great tools, but uh, this is the only good tool for named pipes communication uh, and this, uh, this is the tool I was using during my research. So how does the communication looks like when you open Wireshark? Because I told you that named pipes can be remotely uh, accessed. So this is how it looks like. You can see here a Wireshark window and you can see that the named pipe is using SMB communication and here at the bottom you can see that this is total clear text. So whatever is being transferred to a remote named pipe can be sniffed. But there are some limitations. If you are a programmer and you uh, start your own named pipe, you, you listen to a named pipe, you can protect it. So how can you do it? Using uh, ACLs. Named pipes are implemented by a file system drive in Windows NT, started from Windows 8, in fact. Uh, and uh, they follow the uh, ACLs, or uh, DACLs, discretionary access control list permissions uh, that are, uh, but the default uh, value is that the permission is set to anyone or anonymous login. So if you create your own name pipe and you, not, you don't set the ACLs specifically, anyone can connect to it. So uh, many uh, named pipes allows rem uh, either anonymous access or 
only domain user access, but obviously it's still a lot of users that can exploit vulnerabilities in it. Uh, you can modify uh, ACLs uh, and to make uh, only specific users access uh, named pipe, but uh, this is not the default behavior, and unfortunately, I witnessed a lot of named pipes that just didn't do it, and I'm going to show you some examples. So, here is a named pipe, for example. It co it, uh, this is a Windows built-in named pipe. It, it is called init shutdown. And you can see that the permissions for this name pipe is everyone, anonymous, and administrators, which actually has no effect because everyone can access it. So anyone can access any shutdown and, um, name pipe, and this is a built-in Windows operating system name pipe. And named pipe, unlike any other um, interface you know, uh, either uh, regular SMB files or sockets have an additional feature which is, which is called maximum instances. Uh, a connection to a named pipe is called an instance, a named pipe instance. And on the left you can see the, um, uh, the different named pipes and their current number of instances. And on the right you can see that there, are, there is a maximum volume uh, for some of them. Uh, if the val value is minus one, there, then there is no uh, limitation. But if this is not minus one, then the, uh, there can be a, number, a maximum number of connections or instances to these named pipes. So you can see here uh, several named pipes with the value one or the value seven. So it means that you cannot just connect to it without any limitation. So let's talk about named pipes in the wild. Most of you probably heard about the Conficker war or Conficker virus uh, that uh, was detected in November 2008. Uh, it used flaws in Windows operating system uh, and it used dictionary attacks on administrator passwords to propagate while forming in a botnet. And it used advanced malware techniques, similar to the recently discovered NotPetya and WannaCry uh, ransomers and, and malwares. So, uh, it uh, infected uh, a lot of computers, millions of computers, in 190 countries, and it had several variations. This is how it looked like. Very nice. One variation, which is dubbed name variation C, creates a named pipe over which it pushes URLs for downloadable, downloadable payloads to other infected computers in your LAN. So if you have one computer that is infected and it gets the command from the command and control center, it just propagate this command through named pipes in order to make sure that the rest of uh, the infected computer gets the same command as well. And this is uh, not only used by Configure, but by others as well, such as Mocker, uh, ZX Search Shells, and even the famous, now famous, Petya. So how can you enumerate and scan for named pipes. If you want to have a look at your own named pipes in your own Windows computer, you can just use the sysinternals pipe list. This is the best tool for enumerating named pipes. Uh, and you can just uh, run it and immediately see what we just witnessed in the, uh, pre in the previous slide. All of the pipe names, the current number of instance instances, and the maximum number of instances. Uh, so this is what you should use if you want to, uh, to see what named pipes are listening in your own computer. Uh, there, were, uh, there are uh, multiple tools of uh, checking the uh, access control lists for named pipes. This is a deprecated tool. It is called, be uh, called Beyond Security, Pipe Security Editor. Um, but unfortunately, it is unmaintained and deprecated because uh, it only works in Windows XP or older. Uh, but you can see that uh, this tool uh, used to uh, allow you to edit name pipes permissions in real time, just like as you do with files. So unfortunately, there are no similar tools for newer versions of Windows, uh, and this is a, a deprecated tool. But for current wi Windows versions, you can use the sysinternals pipe ACL. It comes with the same package, it's pipe list. And when, once you activate it, you see the uh, output that we saw earlier, which, uh, which tells you which uh, groups have permissions for the current 
name pipe that you're checking. In this example, I was checking the, another Windows operating system um, uh, named pipe, which is called LSA RPC, and yet again, anonymous access to everyone. So how can you remotely enumerate named pipes? There aren't many tools for doing it, but there are several scripts in Metasploit, uh, not very common scripts and not well known, uh, but uh, you can use it uh, nonetheless. This is called Pipe Editor, and you can uh, use it in order to remotely uh, scan for named pipes. If you want to uh, scan it using SMB, uh, you use the original Pipe Editor script. If you want to use it uh, uh, to scan it using RPC, you use Pipe DC RPC auditor. So here you can see an example of uh, executing uh, Pipe DC RPC auditor uh, that allows you to uh, to scan remotely. It, uh, this uh, script has their own uh, database of uh, name pipe names because it's not like scanning for ports. You don't know all of the values of the valid values. Uh, so you need to have a list of uh, uh, name pipes. I don't know how this is well maintained or not, uh, but you can still try to use it. So, how can you sniff content of named pipes? Let's say you want to discover a new vulnerability, a new remote code execution, or a new denial of service. The first thing that you need to do is to get a valid communication. So how can you do it? So, IO Ninja to the rescue, yet again. Uh, IO Ninja, uh, as I told you earlier, is the Swiss army knife of named pipes. Uh, you can use it both to connect to name pipes, to listen to name pipes if you want. You can even create a, a name pipe server and also to use it as a named pipe sniffer. And this is a new model in IO Ninja. So you can see in my own computer, I can start it. It has some bugs because every now and then it finds name pipes, anonymous name pipes that it cannot read, but if we wait a little bit. Let's see if I see some name pipes communication. As I told you, it's a rather new uh, model, so it's not perfect yet, but... Let's just wait for a second or two. This is not me, this is the Windows operating system I went in for. Come on, Bill Gates, no? Okay, I'll just show you in the presentation. So, so this is how it looks like. When you see communication, so you can see the open the pipes. In this example, it's MMS server, and you can see the entire communication, totally clear text. Unless, of course, the protocol itself uh, embeds uh, encryption of any kind. So a key process of finding vulnerabilities, uh, either uh, if you want to jailbreak iPhone or you want to find any um, unmanaged code vulnerabilities, uh, is fuzzing. And this is what we're doing. If you are not familiar with fuzzing, let's just quickly uh, go through the, the uh, basic uh, terminolo terminology and definition of it. Fuzzing or fuzz testing is an automated software testing technique that involves providing invalid, unexpected, or random data. You just bombard the interface with any unexpected values. But uh, it sounds a little bit by, like QA, but this is done automatically. QA is uh, usually done manually. You have the QA guy that just uh, writes the scripts and send it. Uh, and um, uh, fuzzers do it for you, the automatic fuzzing tools do it for you in the fuzzing process. Uh, you then monitor uh, the program that you are trying to crush or to find vulnerability in, and if anything is wrong, you know that um, you can uh, uh, further investigate it. Usually, uh, fuzzers are used to test unmanaged code, C and C++, uh, because uh, usually you want to find any sort of buffer overflows. And for example, Microsoft uh, embeds fuzzing processes in their, um, in their development operation for any product they do. For example, if you have uh, Microsoft Office, they perform multiple fuzzing uh, on each and every uh, application of it and they found multiple vulnerabilities in their parsers. So this is a very uh, useful technique in finding bugs. And, but there are in fact two kinds of fuzzings, dump fuzzing or black box fuzzing and smart fuzzing. 
dump files in is uh, you just go over uh, uh, go, go over all the possible inputs without understanding understand the expected one. You just bombard it with random data or with sequential data, and you don't understand what's the purpose of the parameter that you are trying to fuzz. Uh, this is simple to implement, very fast to implement, sometimes impossible to execute uh, because you have multiple multiple options, and the code coverage is very poor. You don't cover all of the different options in the programmer's code. On the other hand, there is the smart fuzzing, or white box fuzzing. In this uh, technique, you understand the expected input. You understand each parameter that is being sent to the interface, in this example, the name pipes, and you modify, slightly modify, and test uh, using, uh, in, in the edges of these, uh, uh, the valid values to check for uh, bugs and errors. Uh, so this is smart data generation, and uh, if you have, for example, a file, and you have a checksum field, so in smart fuzzing you need to calculate it, and of course it is harder to implement. Uh, we in Comstack, we don't have a lot of resources like different companies that presented before, uh, before me, so uh, we weren't doing a lot of smart fuzzing, mostly focused on dumb fuzzing, but still we found very, very interesting vulnerabilities, and the reason that I show you this presentation is I want others to move forward and uh, use smart fuzzing as well to find new, new zero-days vulnerabilities. So we also found uh, like this nice little script that is called advanced pipe fuzzer. You can download it from this URL. Uh, and uh, it was written many years ago, but uh, as I told you, not many people know that uh, named pipes are ac can be accessed remotely, so it was uh, hard-coded for local named pipes only. So we slightly modified it and improved it a little bit, and we used it uh, in our research in order to find the vulnerabilities that I'm going to show you in our live demo. So let's see uh, some examples of uh, exploitation and impacts. So many pieces of uh, software work with hidden or undocumented APIs. This can either be a web server or a Windows application server that uh, listens to a named pipe which is totally undocumented. Uh, the forgotten nature of named pipes leaves uncharted territory of socket-like interfaces that contains vulnerability. Remote denial of service, buffer overflows, remote code execution, and any kind of vulnerability that you can think of. Named pipes fall in between application penetration tests and infrastructure penetration tests. If you are an applicative penetration tester, you probably usually uh, just uh, use the normal ports, which is obviously HTTP, and uh, many, uh, and every once in a while you use other variants as well, but you never look at RPC or an SMB in the first place. If you see R R R RPC or SMB, you just skip it. And most, time, most of the times you, you barely look at it, or even don't know what it is. So uh, uh, application penetration test doesn't look at it. Uh, don't look at it. And if you are in infrastructure penetration test, whenever you see an RPC or SMB port uh, which is open, you try to brute force it. You try to brute force credentials, uh, and you use your um, uh, username and password, admin username and password, and you try to uh, uh, get valid credentials in order to hack into the system, but you never look at the named pipes that listen behind these open ports. If you are an EDR expert, endpoint detect and response, uh, the multiple products that try to defend your, uh, your endpoint uh, user station, uh, you probably don't spe take special notice to remote connections. You know what name pipes are, you know that you can use it in order to hack into stuff and to elevate privileges, but you don't think a lot about remote, the remote nature uh, that is possible, remote connection of the name pipes. So if your software, if your Windows installed software reads data from named pipes without validation, it's like any vulnerable application. You can have multiple vulnerabilities, including buffer overflow, that can, be, can lead to denial of service or even, in some cases, remote code execution. So if named pipe ACL, access control list, allow remote access then remote denial of service or remote code execution can be triggered. Research of cause behind the crash will allow the attacker to facilitate it as a zero-day vulnerability. If you'll find uh, um, vulnerability in one of Windows name pipe interfaces that can be connected remotely, and there are several such interfaces, 
This can be used in order to spread malwares like WannaCry or NotPetya. Imagine the new NotPetya 2 or something similar that can utilize named pipes vulnerabilities. And of course, remote denial service is game over. So let's see a case study of some interesting vulnerabilities that we, uh, we saw in three different Windows applications, Viber, QBTorrent, and SugarSync. You probably all know Viber, but just in case you just landed from Moth or from the Moon, this is a cellular and endpoint social communication uh, application. Uh, the most uh, common one is installed on your mobile device, but there is another version that you can install on your Windows operating system. It allows you to, uh, uh, to perform free calls, text, pictures. Uh, this is a com uh, the major competitor of WhatsApp, and it had 800 million users worldwide. QBTorrent, this is a, a, a torrent client. Probably most of you know what torrent is. This is a cross-platform client for a BTorrent protocol, free and open source written in C++. And SugarSync, the last application that I'm going to show you the demo for, this is a cloud service that enables active synchronization of files across computers and other devices, similar to Dropbox using uh, for file backup, access, syncing, sharing, supports a variety of operating system, including Windows. And this is what I found interesting. And the three applications has one common feature. They all use the, uh, the widely used Qt framework uh, as part of their application. This is a cross-platform application development framework for desktop, embedded in mobile. Uh, it also supports uh, Windows. And in the Windows implementation of Qt Framework, there were a vulnerability in the a, a, a feature or functionality that is called Qt Single App. Uh, this is responsible for writing temporary files, probably to make sure that your application runs only once, that you don't open multiple instances of the same application. So by fuzzy name pipes, we perform just a dumb fuzzing on this interface. We found a remote denial of service, or we, uh, we could remotely crush the programs that I just showed you. And in QBitTorrent, we, uh, we were also able to uh, perform a remote command injection, which I'm going to show you. So I'm now silently praying to the demo gods. If you know the pray, just join me. I encourage you to. So this is the virtual machine. I'm going to do the demo with. This is the IP address. And first, I'm going to activate Viber. Oh, but just a second. Before I activate Viber, Viber let me just show you the different pipes. So I activate PipeList, which is the sysinternal tool for enumerating name pipes. And you can see different windows name pipes in its shutdown that we saw earlier, uh, LSAS, NTS, VCS, probably SVC host, uh, and other uh, services. And once I start Viber and execute it once again, you would see that suddenly I have this name pipe, which contains Viber in it. So obviously this is Qt single app, Viber, and now I'm going to exploit it. So let's get back to my computer. And now, this is Ion Ninja. I'm going to open a file stream that allows me to remotely connect to a named pipe. And I'll just put the right IP in here. What was it again? Thirty-one, one thirty-two. Pipe slash pipe name. Oh, just a second. I have some problems. Uh, you need to be a, a domain user in this example, so I need to put valid set of credentials to have access to any named pipe in this example. So I'll just put username and password. Oh, 
Okay, now I'm connected to Viber's name pipe remotely. And if I put just a single character, this is all what is needed for this vulnerability. If I hit the send button, you would see that now Viber is no longer responding. And this is the case with sugar sync as well. But this time I'm going to perform f a dumb fuzzing using the script I just showed you. So it's starting. And you can see that here I have a very similar name, name pipe, which is called QT Single Up Sugar Sync or Sugar S. And I'm going to copy it. Uh, online, uh, this might look like random characters, but this is in fact uh, fixed values. So if you have Viber and you have SugarSync, you know that these name pipes uh, are fixed. So now I'm going to activate the fuzzer where we're using. OK. And you can see that just after two requests, this is all it needed, and sugar sink is also dead. And the last example I'm going to show you, this is the coolest example we've found. This is in Qt BTorrent. So I'll just copy and paste the name pipe's name. But this time, I won't just send a single character. We witnessed a very interesting behavior in this named pipe. For some reason, they actually use values from this named pipe in order to perform commands. So you can see that I sent two A characters with a space afterward, and then I sent DEFCON 25. And if I send it, we witnessed this error. Torrent file DEFCON 25 does not exist. And now, I prepared this recrawl torrent link, and I just replace DEFCON 25 with the recrawl link. Let me just reconnect to it. And now, QB torrent is never going to give you up. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, mitigation and the defense for the attack that I just showed you. For the developer point of view, if you are a developer, you should know the risk. If you're using name pipes in your Windows application, you should create name pipes with access control list uh, for specific users. You should always follow the least privilege approach. Don't give any redundant uh, permissions that are not needed in order for your application to act to activate correctly. Uh, so uh, uh, just give minimal permissions, uh, the minimal number of users. If it is not uh, remote, it, if it, it, uh, the name pipe should not be remotely accessed, just block it altogether uh, and make it local only. This is al also an option. And if you have uh, the possibility, just limit the maximum number of instances uh, for your name pipe. For users or third-party software clients, know the risk. Just block all unnecessary SMB and RPC services, 135 and 445, obviously, especially over uh, the internet. If you have RPC and SMB open to the internet, you have big problems unrelated to name pipes. So just block it all together. Uh, segment your network, so at least if one um, a computer is affected, it won't uh, be able to spread to other computers as well, or if you have uh, an attacker in one section of your network, you won't be able to exploit these vulnerabilities in other sections as well, and always install latest software security patches. In, just in recent the days, it was found that in uh, Malwarebytes, the famous anti-malware software, there were a, a similar vulnerability to the one I just showed you that allowed you to inject commands uh, as a, a system user. 
so uh, they fixed it, so you need to install the latest version. Uh, and uh, my favorite point of view, which is the hacker's point of view, just know the opportunity and hack. Uh, you should uh, uh, just uh, use the technique that I showed you uh, and, uh, and in order to re search for remote code execution and remote denial of service uh, whenever you see OpenSMP and RPC ports and uh, just have fun. You can use it and utilize it in order to find zero-day vulnerabilities that are completely uncharted. Uh, so, uh, some closing remarks. Windows NAT pipes are forgotten, remotely accessible socket-like interface. You don't need to put your uh, socket number, you need to put the uh, NAT pipe name. Uh, this is a whole newly rediscovered potential world of local and remote vulnerabilities. Incre increased attack surface and don't ignore it because it can lead to significant, uh, significant vulnerabilities. If you liked uh, the presentation, uh, I encourage you to contact us uh, in ComSec. Uh, we are a small consultant company and we are not as big as the, the companies that we're presenting. So uh, in order to support our work uh, and to work with professionals, uh, I, we, I encourage you to contact us. Uh, I have my email uh, in, in the end. We are a small company, so we, pretty, uh, uh, we have the speed and the agility uh, in multiple uh, services. Um, that includes penetration tests of all kind, uh, security development lifecycle, uh, architecture design, um, uh, GRC services, ISO 27001 and PCI DSS, and also red teaming, uh, DDoS simulation, and uh, offensive security uh, services of all kind. So, if you have any question uh, or you want to contact me following my presentation, or uh, of course, if you want to um, to contact me regarding uh, working with Comsec, uh, you have my Twitter and my LinkedIn and email. Uh, and I want to thank uh, everyone that participated in this research. Uh, and uh, also, I want to take Viber, who were the only one to take this vulnerability seriously. We tried to uh, to contact other uh, application owners as well, but we couldn't. Uh, so I want to take uh, Viber as well. And uh, Adi, happy birthday, and Mazaltov. And uh, thank you.